Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 23rd, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you can also follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain how the data demonstrates the real driver of Alaska outmigration is faltering Alaska household income, which PFD cuts only make worse. Second, we look at this year's PFD cut and explain how it exemplifies the legislature's not-so-secret revenue approach of the less you make, the more we take. And third, we explain why, if Larry Persily is truly concerned about tax unfairness, he should focus even more on the legislature than he has on the governor. And now, let's join Michael. Brad, the uh, the weekly top three this week is just, uh, I mean, I've got comments and questions and everything else, but uh, let's, uh, let's start off with... <clears throat> the true cause of out migration and this all begins with a piece by uh, uh zach fields um one of our favorite people uh who tries his damnedest to tie out migration to of course some of the largest government spending components we can find right and it's it's tying it all to things like uh what what, what was oh a decade of education funding cuts. I mean, that 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 is so blatantly false, but people are just gonna lap it up like mother's milk, man. Uh, and and this whole this the insecurity and and instability of importing gas. And I mean, I'm sorry, I don't I don't mean to get ahead of you. Give me the I'm so I think we just did the segment. <laughs> I am so agitated this morning about this. Go ahead. Tell us a little bit about uh, the the out migration tie, the true cause of out migration. Well, this is this is the 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 old Rahm Emanuel, never let a crisis go to waste uh, uh, in in on steroids. So out migration is an issue. Out migration for those who haven't followed along is the fact that we're losing more people. Uh, than are coming to Alaska. We're losing more residents that are coming to Alaska. We're having a net out migration uh, is, is, what the, is what the phrase refers to. And it's particularly, I mean, we've tracked this through and we've talked about it on the show. You can look at the IRS data and it's particularly strong in middle and lower income Alaska families and working, working class Alaska families. The top 20% actually Looking at IRS data, the top 20% is actually rising, increasing in number in Alaska. Um, so and so are the so are the those over 60. So the the retirement or near retirement age uh, classes are are increasing. Where the loss is really being suffered is in the middle and lower income Alaskans and in the and in Alaskans uh, below age 60, six, age 60 and below, uh, which uh, which typically is is where you're you're working. Uh, population comes from. So we are suffering. There's no question about, about the fact that we're suffering. What's happening is everybody is, is latching onto that for their favorite cause and saying, oh, this is the cause of out migration. And so if we just did this, 
uh, we would uh, we would bring more people uh, we bring more people into Alaska. And Zach Fields is the latest to jump on that jump on that crisis, uh, and he's got an op-ed piece in this week's uh, ADN that goes through the laundry list of things that Zach Fields would like to uh, would like to spend on. Uh, the, the title is we must invest in Alaska and goes through the laundry list of, of things Zach Fields would like to spend on, starting with, uh, essentially a state takeover of Cook Inlet gas by ADA going in and, and either low through low interest loans, subsidizing, or just outright, uh, buying equity, uh, co-investing with, uh, in fields with Bluecrest and with, uh, Hex. Um, and, and essentially transferring a portion of the losses that those fields are incurring, trying to, to compete with market with with the market, trying to compete in the market, transfer a portion of the losses those fields are suffering, those producers are suffering to the state, and let the state absorb um, uh, those those losses, and as a consequence, be able to sell uh, uh, state subsidized gas, essentially state subsidized gas in one form or another, uh, into the Cook Inlet. That's Zach's number one. Target, and then he goes through the laundry list. Retirement benefits. My gosh, we're suffering out migration because we don't have public employee retirement, uh, uh, a defined benefit plan. And then he goes into uh, huge class sizes, K through 12. We're not spending enough on K through 12, and and huge class sizes are a reason we have out migration. Um, and then he, uh, it just it just keeps on going through the laundry list of things that would. Um, Interestingly enough, increase uh, government employees and in, increase government union employees, which Zach represents in his in his uh, in his private life, um, increase those and increase and increase government spending. What we've done is we've gone to look at the numbers as opposed to as opposed to just, you know, the touchy feely. Oh, I know what's causing it because I have a good grip on these things. Um, and we've looked at the numbers and you can go to. Uh, the, the the Federal Reserve St. Louis, which has just this wonderful series of charts that you can you can develop and and look at and compare all sorts of all sorts of various things. And we've looked at what's going on, a couple of a couple of factors that are going on with respect to Alaska population. If you've got that, Michael, pop it up for a second. Uh, thank you. All right. So this chart plots over. We've been looking at things from 2000, uh, 2004, a variety of things from 2000. Uh, forward. This charts Alaska population, which is the top line, uh, the what it looks like brown uh, on the on the chart, the top line, and, and plots that over time since 2000, and then uh, plots uh, real median household income in the United States, the the median income for uh, per family in um, in the in the United States as a whole. And that's the blue line, the, the the thick blue line that runs through the middle, and then plots Alaska median income, real median income after inflation, median income is what I mean by real. Uh, plots that, uh, and that's in the the brown or the orangish line uh, that's spending a lot of its time on the bottom. And here's what you here's what you see when you look at the Alaska population line. It goes up and up and up, and this is on a scale uh, of of 100, the base being uh, the 2020 number, and then the increase or decrease since 2020 uh, is what's being measured in these other lines. And you look at the population, and it two, starts in 2000, it goes up and up and up and up and up until about 20, 20, 2017. Uh, and then it starts coming down. It's, you could look at the line and say it's, it's, it's stabilizing, but actually it's coming down. It's starting to come down. And that's an indication of the of the of the of the population out migration that we're suffering, and again, if you went inside that line, the top twenty percent and the and and older Alaskans, those sixty and older, that number's going up. Uh, what's really driving that number down is middle and lower income Alaskans and uh, Alaskans uh, below sixty uh, percent working age Alaska families. That's what's driving that number down. So the number starts in about twenty seventeen and, and and starts coming down. Look what else happens in about 2017. Alaska uh, median household income goes a little bit below U.S. median is household income uh, uh, for some of the time. It goes above 
median household income, U.S. median household income for some of the time. But in 2017, there's a sharp break. It craters. It does. It's not a sharp break. That's a cratering. And what happens is U.S. median income goes up, uh, goes up significantly from 2017 on, while Alaska median income is going down from 2017 going on. And again, if you go inside those numbers, go inside the Alaska numbers, the top 20% number is actually going up. Real median income uh, uh, among the top 20% Alaskans are going up. Same is true for those above 60. It is middle and lower income Alaska families, and it is Alaskans, working age Alaska families, uh, headed by somebody that's in the working age, uh, below 60, that are going down. And so what's driving that number down is if, if it was just the top 20% and just uh, older Alaska fam, uh, older Alaskans, that number would be going up. The Alaska real median average income would be going up. What's driving that number down is, is what's going on with middle and lower income Alaska families and Alaskans below 60%. And so you see that in 2017, Alaska population starts coming down and you see that the divergence between U.S. median household income and Alaskan, Alaska's uh, median household income is, go, is, is sharply going down. And again, it's going down more for those in the in middle and lower income brackets and it's going down for the, those more uh, working age. It's not, it's not the failure to ha have toys. It's not the failure to have um, uh, investments in all the things that Zach Fields and other want to invest in. It's the fact that we don't, that the median, that, that, that middle and lower income Alaska families and working age Alaska families have dropping income, dropping real income. Compared to inflation, the income is dropping. Compared to the lower 48, compared to, to the U.S. average, the income is dropping. It's not the law. It's not the lack of investment. It's the lack of income that's affecting uh, Alaska's uh, uh, out migration, and 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 the the correlation between the 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 point at which at which uh, uh, population starts going down, and the point at which Alaska real income starts coming down, uh, is 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 stark. I mean, they're just occurring right. at the same period of time. Alaska income is coming up, but it still is lagging uh, lower 48 U.S. average uh, right. uh, income. And so it's we're not, we're not it's not the lack of investment. It's the lack of income that's 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 causing this problem. And Zach Field's solution, which is for government to spend more, which means government would have to take more out of the pockets of Alaskans, and because we use PFD cuts more out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families, Zach Field's solution would actually make it worse right. by reducing income even more. Yeah, I mean, that's a, the answer here, of course, is more, more government spending, more government spending, more out of the pocket of private individuals, more out of the private economy, not even caring what the private economy is doing. Again, this goes back to that divorcing of the public and the private economy where they don't see any connectivity. And so they immediately connect anything, any of their prep projects to the uh, to to the problem about migration. And that's obviously not the answer. Uh, final thoughts on this, Brad, before we move on. Well, legislators, I mean, Zach Fields is, is, is indicative of the problem with, we have with our legislators. Legislators in Alaska tend to say problem solution is more government spending when without looking really at the numbers and without really looking at the cause. The, 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 the problem here isn't lack of government spending. The problem here is loss of income. And we're making it worse by using PFD cuts, which are, which are targeting the very Alaskans that are that are affected by the loss of income, we're we're making we're making it worse instead instead of better. So legislators should think: How do I get income up, as opposed to how do I get government spending up, which makes income worse? And of course, the other factor is, of course, as our economy continues to stutter and suffer, is that um, you know the outside economy has been doing fairly well, uh, and so it becomes more attractive. Do I sit here and take the slings and arrows and the pains of trying to live here with a reduced income, or do I go to another state where things are booming and, uh, you know, we just sit here and, and do it? 
Chris asks the question from YouTube, is there a chance that the line drop on the graph is directly caused by the overtaxation of the PFD? I mean, I think that's a direct correlation to what you were just talking about, right, Brad? Well, some of that drop, I mean, the income, the drop in income is huge and there's more going on than just the cut in the PFD. But the cut in the PFD is certainly is certainly contributing to it. Um, and and the fact that we that we continue to cut the PFD, that we haven't restored the statutory P PFD, the current law uh, PFD is certainly continuing to weigh on uh, on Alaska income. It costs more uh, to, to live in Alaska. We all know that. Um, and and part of the way of dealing with that is having higher income. But now we've got a situation where Alaska income, real household income, uh, is declining uh, compared to the lower 48. People are mobile. I mean, yeah, you got well, a job here, you, and you that's a, a job in the lower 48. Well, see, that's the blessing of COVID these days is that people are even more mobile than they used to be. They can work, you know, across state lines. They can be mobile. They can be lightweight. People, you know, people's mindset changed after COVID. I mean, they thought they were, you know, they thought they were going to die. And so people divested themselves of stuff and they went out and did things and they just, you know, the, their priorities changed and they started to, they started to, uh, you know, to idolize experiences more than necessarily than income. And I mean, so many things changed in the workforce on top of that. Uh, and the fact is, is that we were in the middle of a recession uh, and still hadn't come out of it by the time COVID hit. I mean, there's a lot of factors going in there, but the bottom line is, is that more government spending does not help with this. No matter how much they want to point, paint the picture that that's what we need is more. That's not what's going on. It, it's it's almost like it's almost like they want to deal with. I've, I've toyed with this as a title for a for a Friday column. It's almost like they want to deal with this by increasing the number of rides at Disneyland. Right? We want to attract you to Disneyland by increasing the number of rides. Now. We're going to increase the prices too, and and so your your real ability to spend on these rides is going down. But we want to increase the 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 toys. We want to increase the 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 trinkets that are around. And and people like Zach Fields and others say, well, if we just increase the tr trinkets, if we just increase the number of rides uh, at Disneyland, then we'll uh, then we'll attract more people. No, people have to have income. People want <laughs> people need to have income to live. And if your real income is going down, your inflation adjusted income is going down. And particularly if it's going down at the time when your competitors in other states, real income is going up, uh, you're just going to leave. I mean, you can have all the trinkets you want. You can have all the rides you want. But but I guess to continue the analogy, you're going to go to Universal, uh, which has as, as many rides, but has but has cheaper prices. You're going to go someplace else instead of going to Disneyland, and that's what's going on here in Alaska. We are we're trying. Some say we need to increase the number of rides. We need to, need to increase the amount of government spending, but your real income is going down. What what we need yeah. in the legislature are champions who talk about income, income of Alaskans, and how to improve the income of Alaskans as opposed to, oh no, we're just going to increase the number of rides right. and we'll attract people that way. Well, and the problem is we keep looking to the, to the government, whether it's the state or the Fed. Frank says, bingo, the ADN had an editorial. Why is this state repeatedly dropping the ball on federal funding? Why do, well, Stop looking at government funding. I mean, what is happening to the private economy? That is, I mean, that is, that's the whole problem here. I mean, why are we ignoring what's happening in the private economy as if somehow the government actually produces anything? Government is a net consumer. It's not a producer. There's only so many dollars in the economy right now that are being produced, and it's all being produced by the private sector. So the government can take whatever it wants, but it's not producing anything in that regard. And, and that's the problem. Even if it's hiring, it's just redistributing private sector dollars through itself, uh, five seconds here. Sorry, I didn't mean to bloviate. Let's well, go. Just, uh, Hold on. The Zach Field solution is to suck more money out of income. And that's the wrong solution. Fred Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. The weekly top three continues. Uh, we're on to number two. Uh, number two, the not so secret Alaska legislative motto. They have a motto, Brad, apparently. Did they get a tattoo? I just want to know. Is it, you know, tat what, what is the not-so-secret Alaska legislative motto, and uh, what's your point on it? Let's, uh, let's talk about that. Well, the not-so-secret Alaska motto is the less you make, the more we take. 
uh, the less money you have in your pocket, the more of it we're going to take as a, as a percent of the money you have in your pocket. That's the motto. The, I guess the converse of that or, or the, the, the flip side of that is the more you make, the less we take. The more money you have, the less we're going to take of it because we're taking it from those who have less uh, instead to cover, cover this government spending. What triggered that, what triggered that realization that that's the Alaska legislative motto is the announcement of this year's permanent fund dividend and, and looking at the impact of the permanent fund dividend cuts on Alaskans, uh, the amount that the government withheld the legislature, which essentially has a veto on this issue, the amount the legislature withheld uh, uh, to, to, to fund government as opposed to distributing it according to the, according to the statute. We see all sorts of articles out there in all of the various uh, press, the ADM, the Alaska Beacon, the Juno Empire. Uh, Ketchikan uh, had an article. Fairbanks had an article. We see all sorts of articles out there about the size of the PFD. A few of them, not many, compare it to the size of the PFD in the governor's budget that was announced, uh, that the governor announced last December, the projected amount of the PFD. A few of them say, well, this is the amount of the PFD the legislature has appropriated compared to the size of the PFD that uh, that the government uh, that the governor proposed, but none of them, none of the news outlets take it down the, to the level of what's the impact of of the PFD cuts on Alaska families. What's the impact of of what's going on with Alaska families? None of them do that. They all just parrot the administration's. Um, uh, uh, press release that said this is the amount of the PFD and boy, aren't we lucky that we're getting any money at all. We, on the other hand, uh, took to the numbers and and have have done an analysis uh, that we'll talk that we'll write about more this coming Friday, but we've done an analysis of what the impact of these PFD cuts, the PFD cuts this year are on Alaska families. And this is a great follow on to the first segment that talks about the problem without migration is income among middle and lower income, among among working age Alaska families. The problem is income. And now we're going to talk about one of the drivers of why that income is going down and, and how Alaskans are being affected by, which Alaskans are being affected by the income drop. For those on the radio, I, Michael just put up a chart that shows the, um, in, in the blocks, in the, in the columns, shows the average income by income bracket taken from IRS data, uh, has a red line that shows the percent of government take by that same income bracket, the share of income that's being taken through PFD cuts uh, by income bracket, and shows as a yellow or as a gold dotted line, the average level of take. That is, if you just looked at the amount of the PFD cuts uh, compared to overall adjusted gross income, uh, this would be the average effect across across all income brackets. It is it is in essence a calculation of what the flat tax would be if you used a flat tax uh, to raise the same amount of money as they're raising through PFD cuts, and and the numbers are 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 stark. Uh, the IRS breaks down income brackets into the top one percent, the top five percent, the top ten percent the top 25%, then they switch over to quartiles, the top 25%, the upper middle 25%, the lower middle tw uh, 25%, and then the low 25%. And what we've got with these columns is the average income in each of these, in each of these quartiles. In the top 1%, the average income, according to IRS data, the average income of the top 1% in Alaska, average income is roughly $1.5 million a year. That's the average income. And from that category, from that income bracket, PFD cuts are taking 0.3%. That then, that number then climbs, the percent taken from, uh, from the various income bracket then climbs uh, the farther down uh, in income you go. The top 20, 25%, the top quartile has an average income, top quartile has an average income of two hundred and fifty thousand to be to 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 be an average earner in the top in, average income in the top quartile, uh, the income is two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. PFD cuts take 
2.0% uh, from that uh, income bracket. The average take from all the income brackets is roughly 3.9%. So from the top 25% to top 25%, if we all paid, if we all chipped in as an average share of income to pay for the government costs that are being taken through PFD cuts, we'd all have a tax of about 3.9%. The top 20%, top 25% is getting away with a, with only contributing 2% compared to, uh, compared to the 3.9%. And then you go to the, go to the subsequent income brackets. The upper middle income bracket is, is the PFD cuts take 4.6 on average from that income bracket, take 7.1% uh, on average from the lower middle income bracket, uh, and take 15% as a share of income from the low 25% income bracket. In other words, by using PFD cuts, the legislature is taking more from those who have less. The less you have, the less income you have, the more as a percent of income uh, the legislature is taking. 30 you- times more, 30 times more at, at the lower income versus the upper income. Yep, yep, exactly right, Michael. And, and, and so you wonder about, you go back to the pre, you go back to the previous segment and you think about what is causing this income, this, this income problem, what's causing the out migration, what's driving lower Alaska income among guess who middle and lower income Alaska families and among those 60 and below. Um, And then you look at a chart like this and you say, well, this is a big contributor to it. We are taxing through PFD cuts, we are taxing the very people that we claim we want to keep. Zach Zach Fields wants to keep them by building more Disneyland rides. But what we're doing is we're driving them more and more out of the state by lowering their their income more and more compared not only to an absolute, but also compared to what's going on in the lower 48. It's a surprise. Frankly, we haven't lost more uh, uh, people when you look at this sort of revenue approach that the state that the state's using. And as I said, Fields's and others approach of, well, we're just going to build more Disneyland rides. What we need to do is is spend more government money on the Cook Inlet. We need to spend more money on K through 12. We need to spend more more money uh, on on this, that, and the other thing. And we're going to take it out of the pockets. We're going to continue to use PFD cuts and continue to take it out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families. You're just driving this problem deeper and deeper and deeper. So it's it it's it the 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 press is not doing Alaskans any favors by stopping the story at here's what the PFD is and here's what it would have been had we followed the statute or had we used the the governor's budget. They're not stepping further and looking at the impact of using PFD cuts to fund government on uh, on Alaska families. And that's and that's what this chart and what the other analyses we've done that tries to break down the distributional effects of PFD cuts do. They look at that impact by income bracket and this is roughly the same type of analysis you would see if you did it by age. Right. Uh, because older 60 and older Alaska families have higher incomes and have growing incomes compared to there's uh, compared to those below 60 real incomes compared to those below 60. One of the interesting numbers for me is that, you know, that upper middle class number where you're making $87,000 or more in that upper middle class, you're paying, you know, 15, 20 times uh, as a portion of your income compared to what the top 1% is paying as far as, as a, as a portion of their income towards that kind of thing, because probably most of the listeners of this program is somewhere in the upper middle uh, t- between the upper middle and the top 20%, that's probably where they fall in there between 85 and $150,000 in income. And you're paying again, t- 15, 10, 15, 18 times what as a percentage of your income towards state government than, than the, uh, the higher income earners it's, and, and, and there's less of them than there are of you. So they're taking that bigger uh, chunk out of all of those folks, and people just don't even think about it. There's, you know, I was saying it earlier this week is that people used to be more like, oh, uh, you know, they were outraged about what, what's happened with the PFD. And these days, 
they're not as outraged. They're more like, mm, meh. I mean, it kind of feels that way, right? It's like they're, they're, it's almost like they've lost hope in trying to stop this thing. Well, I think, I think part of it's lost hope. But I think part of it's lack of information. I mean, the governor, if I, if, 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 if the governor truly believed in the PFD, he would be highlighting impacts like this. He would be showing the, imp, the impact by income bracket, the impact by age group. Uh, of what PFD cuts are doing, showing what the legislature's doing by using PFD cuts to fund government. If the governor were truly concerned about about the PFD, he would be he would be doing that. He's not. The press isn't. Uh, and so I don't think Alaskans really understand how they're being treated, the unfairness with which they're being treated uh, uh, by using PFD cuts uh, as a as a source of government revenue. I think I think. They're lulled into thinking, oh, everybody's affected the same because, you know, it takes the same amount out of everybody's pocket. They don't look at it on a share of income basis and look at the disparity in impact on a share of income basis uh, that, uh, that, that PFD cuts are. And the reason is they're not seeing the information. Uh, <laughs> And you summate this whole thing with a quote at the very bottom of the chart, which we didn't get to, but it says, let's be honest, a cut to the PFD is a tax, the most regressive tax ever proposed. And that was from the ICER professor, Matt Berman, in his recent article here last year uh, in the ADN, basically calling a spade a spade and saying it is, it's a tax, the most regressive tax ever proposed by taking it from, from, uh, from, you know, the vast majority of Alaskans. Yeah, we have people who are outraged when, I mean, I, I still recall when uh, Representative Carpenter proposed a sales tax. Uh, Democrats uh, in the legislature had this visceral reaction. Oh, my God, sales tax, hugely regressive. Can't ever have a sales tax. You know, if we're ever going to do anything, it needs to be something other, other than a sales tax. <laughs> and the irony of that was that PFD cuts are orders of magnitude worse in terms of their regressivity, in terms of their adverse impact on middle and lower income Alaska families, orders of magnitude worse than, uh, yeah. than sales taxes. And yet that is something that those same Democrats who were complaining about sales taxes, that's something that they continually vote. Harold actually asked an interesting question, which <clears throat> I think uh, would be an interesting thing to have on the chart somewhere there, Brad. He says, you need something similar to volume weighted average price. How many low income folks are there versus higher income earners as well? Um, I, I think that would be an interesting uh, comparative to have somewhere, you know, or built, baked into the chart in some way, uh, because I think it would also show that there's a smaller percentile of those top income earners who are basically controlling the way the spending of the state is going, and they're holding the rest of the state hostage, essentially, to this government spend and forcing them to pay. Because I guarantee you there's a lot more low-income earners than there are top-income earners in the long run. Well, that's that's what the quartiles are, though, Michael. I mean, so the top 20 25% is 25, 25% of the households in Alaska. The right. upper, upper middle income of 25% is another 25%. The top one percent is the top is the is one percent of Alaska households. So it's it's in there. I mean, and 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 so you, yes, you can make that point. The twenty five percent, the top twenty five percent, pay less than than they would using an average rate um, uh, uh, approach. Certainly, pay less than the than the the upper middle, middle and lower middle do or lower uh, income do. Um, that's that's twenty five percent of Alaska families. The other seventy five percent of Alaska families, and IRS use data uses quartile data as opposed to quintile data. So that's why I'm talking about twenty five percent as opposed to twenty percent. But the other seventy five percent of Alaska families are 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 suffering more, taking having more taken out of their pocket than they would use an average average tax approach. So that's what the that's what the quartiles are doing. They are telling you by quartile, by groups of 25% of Alaska families are telling you what the what the impact is. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Um, let's shift gears real quick. Charlie had a question early on and we didn't get to it. So let me go back to it because I thought it was an interesting question. What do you think about the governor's hiring a firm to examine the permanent funds policies and ethics? 
Um, and this goes back to our discussions on, you know, some of the changes that need to, should happen to the permanent fund board and, and your assertion that we need a more professional board. Um, does it need an, an outside firm to examine it or do we just need to go in there and make it more professional? What, what is your thought on that? Oh, this is this is using leeches to to address a to address a, a a problem. I mean, we've got a problem. The problem isn't the procedures and the policies. The problem is the people. The problem is we don't have sophisticated, professional, experienced investor people knowledgeable about the investment industry. We don't have them on the board. And you can you can deal with. You know, you can put a bunch of lawyers out there and you can put a bunch of reports out there and tell these people to do things differently, but they still don't understand because they aren't investment professionals. So until you deal with it, until you deal with the cancer by going in and addressing the cancer, you know, putting leeches on the body, having having lawyers out there, you know. Whoa, whoa. Did you just compare leeches to lawyers or lawyers? Oh, maybe. Yeah, that might just, be insulting to leeches. I mean, come on. That's a- <laughs> Have, just just having people just having you know reports out there is is uh, is not addressing the central issue um yeah. and 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 we've got and we've got to address the central issue i mean the governor's doing it for pr the government governor does a lot of stuff for pr these days but the governor is doing it for pr i'm active i'm doing something well you're doing the wrong thing to to solve the cancer let's 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 refashion the board let's get a proposal up to refashion the board yeah, and it, and it's not just putting people in who are part of the investment industry, like Ellie Rubenstein, et cetera, uh, who are would might benefit, but for people who have a true understanding and who have worked uh, for you know funds to you know not for glorification of themselves or their own outside interests, but for the actual benefit of the permanent fund. Harold's pointed out several times over the last couple of weeks. The markets are doing well. Why is the fund stalled? Right? I mean, what are they? What What are the investment challenges and changes that aren't happening that should be happening? It's uh, it's and that's it's, and that's the board that decides the allocations. I mean, we can right. we we can complain about you know the 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 staff all we want, but it's the board who decides the allocations between the various investment categories, and that's what's stalling the 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 growth of the of the uh, the, the allocation that we've got right now is what's stalling right. the growth. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. The weekly top three continues. Number three, Larry Persilli, who's never taken an opportunity not to write an opinion piece to increase the size and scope of government. I mean, that guy, oof, man. Uh, but essentially, uh, he's written a piece here recently about analyst analysis, analyst analysis of the governor's vetoes and his actions and everything else. And Brad says, well, he seems to have got it right. Why doesn't he use this same kind of uh, ideology and 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 uh, analysis of the gu- of the uh, legislature's uh, accent uh, on it? But what give me give me your thoughts on this, Brad? You know, occasionally we ha- we I, I read columns or I read something that you know makes me snort my coffee out through my nose. You just I just I just sort of explode in the in 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 a guffaw in the in in humor. And this column by personally. Uh, did, was one of those that did that. Uh, it's an opinion piece. It's in this week's, uh, this past week's uh, ADN. Title of it is Dunleavy's ideological vetoes are making Alaska's tax structure uh, less fair. And and he's talking in that column about the the Turo tax, the the rental car tax that we talked about on a couple of shows back, uh, and about the the inconsistency of taxing one. A segment of the of the rental car industry one way and taxing or not taxing because they aren't enforcing the tax. Another segment of the rental car industry, uh, another way creating a disparity between the the two segments of the rental car industry. And then he also refers to at the end, as I did on the on the segment on the show a couple of weeks ago, right. also refers to the vaping tax and or the e tax or the e cigarette uh, tax that the governor vetoed a couple of a couple of years ago that Gary Stevens had championed to try to increase the tax on e-cigarettes comparable to the um, comparable to the tax on tobacco cigarettes. And, and personally writes an entire column about how uh, this, that, that, that the governor's vetoing uh, uh, legislation that would make the tax structure more fair uh, and in the consequence, making the tax structure less fair. Well, that's great, but we're talking about sort of millions of dollars uh, in in those vetoes, single digit, maybe double digit 
millions of dollars in terms of tax unfairness. What, what struck me about this is that personally is one of the biggest advocates of legislated, leg, the legislature's tax unfairness uh, in terms of using PFD cuts to, to, raise, uh, to raise money for government, as opposed to flat taxes or another approach to taxes that would be more fair uh, among Alaska families between the income brackets. Personally, not only doesn't recognize that as unfairness, he's an advocate of that unfairness uh, in, other, in other columns. Um, and 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 is a is a is a big advocate of using PFD cuts uh, to fund government, notwithstanding the fact doesn't even admit the adverse impact uh, that they have on Alaska families in terms of in terms of the unequal impact, the unfair impact it has on middle and lower income Alaska families. So the hypocrisy of of him writing about tax unfairness when it's the when it's the governor who's engaged in this tax unfairness. I mean, it's the governor who's perpetuating this this disparity between one car, one one part of the rental car industry, and another part of the rental car industry, or one part of the of the smoking, if you include e-cigarettes as part of smoking, one part of the smoking industry as as compared to another. The hypocrisy of complaining about the governor perpetuating tax unfairness in in that situation, but not only ignoring the legislature's tax unfairness in terms of using PFD cuts as opposed to more neutral, more uh, uh, average uh, revenue approaches, more fair revenue approaches. The, the fact that personally ignores that when it's the legislature and indeed is an advocate of it, I think just 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 shows the hypocrisy that, Larry's, that, that, that Larry pursues on these issues uh, in spades. I mean, if it's good enough, it's good enough to complain about the governor when he's engaged in tax unfairness, by gosh, you know, and we're talking about single digit if and double digit millions of dollars. My gosh, you ought to be complaining about the tax unfairness that the legislature is engaged in when when they're set when they're coming up with revenue that is measured in the hundreds of millions of dollars, if not the billions of dollars. Right. right. No, it, it is frustrating. And of course, I love how he he tries to split hairs here. Um, I mean, going back to the vape thing, it's it's interesting because he wrote uh, he writes that the governor said a tax increase on the people is not something I could support that the governor wrote in his veto statement against extending the tax to vape products. Yet it was not a tax increase. And yet it doesn't it, you know, this is just a personal thing. The analysis it, they don't realize is that there's already a tax on these products in many locations, both Anchorage and Wasilla are taxing these things that are approaching 50% of the value, a 50% tax already for people, especially using vape as a smoke cessation thing. It's like you're already taxing. You know, it, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. As long as it's my pet thing, you can't tax it because that's unfair. If it's what I want, then I'm okay with it. Well, and that's, you know. He's not only okay with it. If it's what I want, if, I, if, I, if I'm spending it on what I want, it's not only okay. It's something I'm an advocate of. I mean, that's that's the that's the hypocrisy of this. It it might be one thing if personally was complaining about the governor's tax policy as being unfair and just stopped there. But he doesn't. He doesn't stop there. He's an advocate of the huge tax unfairness that's going on in the leg legislature in terms of using PFD cuts uh, as the revenue source. So it's uh, it's not just it's not just he's a hypocrite because he mentions one thing and he doesn't mention the other. He's a huge hypocrite because he because he mentions one thing and he advocates the exact reverse when it comes to the legislature. There's a theme today, Brad. <clears throat> that theme seems to be more government spending and we should be getting more money. Um, and we should, you know, I mean, this 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 whole theme comes back to more M O A R more in the long run. Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong, but it's more for the wrong thing. I mean, what the first segment showed is we need more income in Alaskans' pockets to make them to, to, to reduce the disparity between what's going on up here and what's going on in the lower 48. And what in the first segment showed that Alaskans are voting with their feet by leaving because we're treating them unfairly, because they have lower income compared to the compared to the compared to the higher income. So it's we, we do need more. But we need more income in the pockets of Alaska families 
as opposed to more pockets in, in more in the pockets of government. And by taking it and, and by saying that we need more in the pockets of government, all we're doing is we're setting up a situation where we're going to be taking even more out of the pockets of working Alaska families, out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families. And it's just, I mean, the 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 disparity is the disparity is huge. The 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 more yes we need more, but we need more in terms of the po- in the pockets staying in the pockets of Alaska families to make them more competitive to make Alaska more competitive with what's going on in the lower forty eight compared to more in the pockets of government. Brad Keithley, uh, final thoughts. We're down to the last two minutes here, so wrap it up for us here. What uh, what what are, what are your what are your what are your thoughts on this? Well, Michael, some people say the PFD is just, you know, is 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 a thing in the past. We don't need to worry about it. Uh, it it's, it's gone anyway and forget about it. The problem is cut using PFD cuts to fund government is having a huge impact on middle and lower income Alaska families, on the income of middle and lower income Alaska families. It's having a huge impact on the competitiveness of Alaska income compared to income uh, in the in the lower 48. And that is driving contributing to the the drop in uh, in uh, in population among working Alaska families. We need to correct that. And we correct that both by talking about the PFD, we correct that by having information out there about the PFD about what it's doing to middle and lower income Alaska families. And we have information and we talk about it by talking about the hypocrisy of some who want to complain about the governor's unfair tax policy, but then turn a blind eye indeed become advocates for the similar unfairness that's going on in the legislature that has an even bigger impact. Brad, what are you working on uh, for this Friday? Final thoughts. One, one minute here. Well, it's going to be the, it's going to be the middle segment we did uh, talking about the impact. I complain about there not being enough information out there. There's I'm, I'm going to put information out there about the impact of this year's PFD cut by income bracket and by, and by family. And I think that's an important thing to look at. Again, understanding that middle class, you know, upper middle class Alaskans are paying 15 to 18 times what their brethren in the upper quintiles are paying towards state government as a portion of their income. That ought to make you mad. I mean, that just ought to make, that just, just ought to agitate you. And if it doesn't, you know, maybe we need to, maybe we need to have more outrage again about the PFD. I mean, Brad, this just really comes back, and I and I sound like a broken record, but this really comes back again and again and again to this disconnect between the public and the private economy. You know, they we see all these problems, right? And whether it's out migration or gas or, you know, all these other things. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that the government has no connection to what's going on in the... You want to know what the out migration problem is? Alaska's pride, uh, private economy is in the doldrums and has been for 15 years, right? We had we were in a recession for years. We never even came out of that recession before COVID hit, and we're still, you know, adjusting to the quote unquote new normal. There, there, you want to know why people are going outside? Greener pastures, better economies, better, you know, better monies, things that they can do. And the government has no, there's no incentive to improve the private economy. Their answer, because they can't see anything else, their answer is always more government spending because they can't see a benefit to the private economy. Yeah, yeah. And they and 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 they're 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 blinding themselves from the information that tells them what's going on in the private sector among Alaska families. Uh, they're blinding themselves from by from that by not doing the distributional analysis that that would show you the impact. I mean the 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 very families that they claim to be, you know, worried about the middle and lower income, the 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 working age Alaska families, the very Alaska families that they claim to be wor- worried about, they're making their lives worse by taking dollars out of their pockets, lowering their family income, lowering household income, um, and and creating an even bigger gap against lower forty eight household income while they're doing it. They're making the problem worse. They're telling themselves if we build more rides at Disneyland, we'll make the problem better because we'll make Alaska more attractive because we'll have more rides at Disneyland. But they're not focusing on the fact that you got to have income before you go to Disneyland. You got to have income 
that 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 makes you want to stay in Alaska uh, before before you even care about the rides. You've got to have enough to make to make your way here. And what's going on when you look at that first chart? What's going on is Alaska real income after inflation income is dropping compared to what's going on on in the lower 48. We're gaining some of it back, but we aren't even close to getting back to the trajectory that the lower 48 uh, income is on. And we're losing population. People think about people think about money in their pocket before they think about Disneyland rides. They think about, can I afford my rent? Can I afford my groceries? Can I afford to live here? Before they think about the Disneyland rides of, of that Zach Fields wants to build out there. And, and, and the legislature is taking is, is going in reverse by taking money out of the pockets of the very, very people that they want to, you know, they want to, they want to keep here, taking po- money out of their pockets to create these additional Disneyland rides that people won't ride because they don't have the income to, to, to stay here. They don't have the competitive income to stay here. Right. So it's, and, and the legislature is blinding itself by not looking at this information on a distributional basis. They're not looking at what's going on to middle and lower income Alaska families, to the income of, to the, to the real income of middle and lower income Alaska families, of working right. age Alaska families. Well, this is that secondary politicians disease. Uh, the uh, uh, Kaffir uh, had a uh, had a, uh, a piece out and Reason was actually writing about this earlier. And this is a bigger problem when they're talking about what's going on at the federal level. Nobody wants to make the hard decisions. The, the PFD pot is an easy pot of money to pull from. That's the easiest thing. Everything else would take work. Everything else might take compromise. Everything else might take, you know, a little bit of effort. Same things happening at the national level. I mean, they should be, you know, Mike Johnson got back in a speaker saying he was going to return to normal order. He can't even get a continuing resolution passed right now uh, to, to keep government funded. They continued to abdicate their responsibilities and take the easy path instead of doing the hard things. And yes, <clears throat> Paying attention to the private economy is one of the harder things because it's just easier to just keep taking it out of the PFD. You don't have to fight with anybody over it. You've got the power to do it, but you're not looking at the unintended consequences and the long-term effects of it. And and you've got people, I mean, I I, I, I complain about Zach Fields and the Democrats, but you've got people like Will Stapp and you got people like Delana Johnson, who was co-chair of House Finance. And their focus is on Government is on, you know, can I restrain the, the spending of government? It's not on income. It's not on family income. And, and you know, and that's that's part of the problem. Everybody's bought in one way or another to the fact, oh, we got to spend. It's just the amount of additional spending we've got to do. They're not focused on how they're raising the revenue and how the way they're raising that revenue is having an impact on middle and lower income Alaska families, on working Alaska families. They're not focused on income. And until you focus on income, until you look at it on a distributional basis, you're not going to get the answer right. Well, and it's the disdain too, right? It's the Jennifer Johnson. All these people are just spending it on big screen TVs or they're drinking it up. It's alcohol or it's, uh, you know, trips to Hawaii or whatever. It's the disdain that they feel for people to be able to make their own decisions. Uh, We had Tyler Ivanoff on the program yesterday and he highlighted, he highlighted all the things that people in his area in a village with no running water, what they're spending it on. And it definitely ain't trips to Hawaii and big screen TVs, right? It's fuel in the tank and it's vehicles that they could be safe in and everything else. But I mean, that's why when you look at it and you see that those people are are affected 30 times more than people in the top 1% that we should be, I mean, those numbers should be stark and people should be paying attention to it. All right, Brad, uh, thanks so much for coming on board with us today. We are out of time. We got to go. Appreciate you uh, sharing with us as always, my friend. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.